This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. We are joined, as usual, by all the usual suspects. I'm Russ. I'm Kyle. Brad, how you doing, sir? Hey, I'm here. I'm good, man. How about you guys? We're doing, doing good. good. Yep, doing good. It's hot. Really, really hot here. Mike? That's what you, you get for living in Texas, dude. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know. We're up on a plateau, and it's still freaking hot here. It's incredibly hot. Randall? Sir. Yes, sir. Is it uh, super hot there where you guys are? Nah, it's tolerable. No. It's not that oh, hot. Good. It's hot. Yeah. I mean, it's hot for a, a, a guy from Minnesota, but. Oh, yeah. But it's not that hot. No, I was out walking around today in it and, you know, sweating is good. So, um, but yeah, you guys, I'm tr- you guys are going to be hotter there up on top of the plateau because you're closer to the sun, right? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly how it works. That yeah. is uh, exactly how it works. Yeah. Plus we have a much bigger sky here in Texas. That's and right. so, you know, yeah, yeah. there's just a lot more light coming down. <laughs> yeah. That would explain that. <laughs> so Randall, we've been, we've spent the last, I don't know how many episodes talking about the fingerprints mm. of catastrophe, as you call them, all the, um, the you know the nano diamonds and the microspherules and other things that you have to use kind of forensic science to look for, mm-hmm. and I'm also we're you know and you've mentioned the footprints like what we see behind Brad there that's a footprint of catastrophe that is definitely a footprint of catastrophe right there behind Brad no doubt yeah. about it. So I'm 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 interested in when do you think we're going to be getting into that and uh, I know that the 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 fingerprints are very important but man let's talk about these giant oh we yeah, listen. It's, it's coming. See, here's, I kind of figured this, it, you know, because of the fact that this whole Younger Dryas impact hypothesis has been so controversial and there are still factions out there trying to dismiss it, right? Based upon the same uh, faulty data, I feel like it's important really to have some place where here we're going to lay out the evidence. You can go through it piece by piece in detail and no, we don't know all the answers, but at the same time, we do know that something really, really remarkable happened. Now, I've made the point that, you know, that these kinds of events, what I think of as these, the, 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 say the discontinuities within the, the stream of the temporal continuum, those discontinuities, the, the nodal points, the event nodes, if you will, where the, where the shit happens, right? So what you've got is these, these places, these intersections, if you will, where <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there has been a gnat here all damn day. Oh, the same gnat. Kill and, it. No, well, I think I, I, just, I think he just did. I think I just <laughs> ate the damn thing. It won't be the first gnat I've eaten, but if next week <laughs> I start talking and I get a flock of gnats coming out of my mouth, you'll understand why. <laughs> damn that see that's what the, that's what july does to you in georgia it brings out the gnats yeah well that was a that was a fingerprint of catastrophe right there that, that was gnat. a fingerprint of catastrophe <laughs> right there damn. did you see that thing you mean i in the big screen you the property you could probably back it up slow it down and you'd see the damn thing just zooming around waiting for the right opening just like you know one of the the, the starfleet fighter jets waiting for that <laughs> opening into the giant wormhole mouth or what, yeah. you know, fly in. <laughs> when Brad does the video editing, we'll make sure he can like pause it and circle the gnat right before yeah. it goes into your mouth. You- <laughs> <laughs> I will search for the gnat. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the first. That's the first though, and hopefully, it's the last. It's the last. <laughs> <laughs> better a gnat than a mosquito, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mosquitoes. Better that than a mosquito. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So back to uh, the matter of hands of catastrophe. Footprints of catastrophe. See, okay. So what I'm going to do, we get the groundwork laid because so much of this evidence, obviously, and the controversy back and forth depends upon the nature of the micro proxy evidence. And what has happened is initially with one team proposing that they, that they saw this stuff, saw the microspherals and all of this, 
and the Nano Diamonds, which goes back to 2007, and uh, Firestone and the, the, the original paper. You see, what we saw is that in the aftermath of that, the controversy was engendered because other groups went out and did testing, and they didn't find it. Right, they they didn't find it. They didn't find anything. So so in the in the scientific literature was published that in, in a lot of cases uh, that it was disproven because you know in science any hypothesis depends on replicability as far as it's uh, w you know whether it, it's a viable idea or not. If you can't replicate it, if you put something out there and then nobody else can replicate it, well yeah, that's pretty falsified. much yeah right. However, in this case, you had a team that went out couldn't replicate it. Uh, and it was then taken as sort of prima facie evidence that because they couldn't replicate it, that the first team didn't really, you know, that it didn't exist. But subsequently, multiple other teams have gone out there and replicated it. And all of this stuff teaches us a lot about what's going on. I mean, you can't really get the picture of what's happening if you don't really understand what's going on chemically in the atmosphere, for example, or what's happening with, the, with the, the amount of sunlight reaching the earth or what might be happening, say, to the geomagnetic field, which we haven't really talked about, but there's evidence that there was something going on unusual with the geomagnetic field. We, we just touched upon that, I think it was last, last episode with Tunguska, that there was actually geomagnetic field aberrations that were actually measured um, as a result of the Tunguska uh, event. But in any ways, because of the fact that the, 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 the controversy uh, between the two camps has mostly revolved around the microproxy evidence, right? So what I've tried to do is show that even though all the issues aren't resolved, because there's not and there's still questions, at this point, the weight of the evidence and the data has certainly, in my mind, come down on the side of the, the, the impact proponents. And there's a lot of very, to me, very interesting material that we haven't even gotten uh, dug into yet. Um, one is the studies in Antarctica that, you know, that the, uh, that the microproxy evidence is showing up in Antarctica. And I've just been reading a, a, um, a paper like uh, this one here is um, from 2018. It's a cosmic impact event in lake sediments from Central Europe. And uh, it marks the onset of the Younger Dryas. And these are guys are mostly Czech. Uh, we've got geologists. What have we got there? We've got geophysicists. We've got geochemists. There's about, it's about 12 of them, a team of about 12 of them. And they've taken four core samples from this bottom of this lake. And we can actually look at it in a minute, so I won't talk about it a whole lot. But basically, what they found is very interesting. And you see... What we're doing with this, with by looking at the microproxy evidence, is okay. We see it in the Channel Islands in California, and then we see it, uh, you know, on the other side of the continent, up in Melbourne, Pennsylvania. And then, because of that microproxy evidence, we were looking at being able to look at the the, the microspherals from Melbourne, Pennsylvania, and realize that there was only one place they could come from, and that was that Quebecia, if that's how you pronounce it, terrain up there along the St. Lawrence Seaway, which almost just perfectly encompasses Lake St. Jean, which we had already talked about as a potential impact site. So now, how, how important and valuable is it to find microproxy evidence in Pennsylvania in the form of microspherals whose geochemistry is pretty much identical to that around Lake St. Jean? You see, so that's where we can kind of start putting together the microscale evidence and the macroscale evidence. Because clearly, if, if Lake St. Jean was an impact site, that would qualify as macro scale, wouldn't you say? I can see it. We could, we could go out in a boat and I could throw you in. And if you had to swim to shore, you might not make it. And you would certainly know that this is a macro scale feature. It's a pretty big lake. <laughs> and it's hundreds of feet deep. So anyways, you see, there's a good example of where there's this bridge now see and the fact that there is this microscale evidence the, the macro the, the microspherals and that's they have the geochemistry identical to the to the uh, bedrock around Lake St. Jean well there we go that that is a pretty convincing evidence because you can look at the macro scale stuff and you can go okay it's got all the earmarks there look it's kind of a sunken basin it's circular 
You know, it seems to have an area that looks like it was a, a catastrophic outrush of water. But how would we tie that into uh, uh, an impact uh, credible enough to convince a skeptical academic community? Well, look, here, we've got uh, microspherals we find abundantly in Pennsylvania that were formed at extremely high temperatures, and their geochemistry is the, the geochemistry of the bedrock around Lake St. Jean. You know, now, oh, hmm, now you, if you're a skeptic, you got to explain that away. So, but back to your question. Yeah, we're segueing from micro scale to macro scale, and that's when it's going to get it's going to get impressive. But you know, there the the the, the work that I've been uh, going to rely on is this one by uh, somebody whose work I've been reading for literally decades uh, in in the realm of paleohydrology is James Teller because he's done a huge amount of work up around the Great Lakes region and so on. Um, documenting gigantic floods, and but never necessarily tying it into a, a possible impact event, right? But now with this paper uh, that came out, I believe last year, yeah, 2019, this is a multi-proxy, let's see, here we go, let's see, a multi-proxy study of changing environmental conditions in a younger driest sequence in southwestern Manitoba, Canada, and evidence for an extraterrestrial event. And, oh, lead author, if you see there, is James Teller. And along with James Teller, we have Malcolm LeCompte, who, the, the, the great Malcolm LeCompte, who came on to the Rogan Show with us um, to help support the idea of, of a, a younger driest boundary impact against the two skeptics, Michael Shermer and um, and the volcanologist who actually, you know, hey, I think those are probably two really great guys. I don't want to, in any way, I, I think they got a bum rap. I didn't like the way they were attacked because they, the skeptics do play an important role because there's just, there's, there's too much woo and, and nonsense out there. It's always a, it's always a balancing act between, you know, having something that's rigorously demonstrable with, with hard empirical evidence and fits all the theoretical data. And then, but then being open-minded enough to, to speculate a little bit, you know, I think it was TC Chamberlain who wrote a paper, God, way back, maybe in the 1890s um, where he was, where he was promoting the value of the outrageous hypothesis. He called it, he said, because his, his, his fellow academics were getting so hidebound and so dogmatic that they that their thinking was becoming constricted, and he said, "No, there's time. There, there is a place for really outrageous speculation." Um, and I've always believed that. But still, even your outrageous speculation still has to be grounded in something. Anybody can claim anything. I prefer to come the other way. In other words, I would rather start by looking at the evidence and and laboriously working through a mass of evidence. And then only at the end, let the evidence suggest this is what happened rather than go, okay, well, this is what happened. Now we're going to line up a bunch of evidence. And that's why, you know, I still say there are a lot of unanswered questions about what happened at the YDB. Um, and I think maybe there's a tendency on the faction of the promoters to think that, the, that it might be settled. But on the other hand, I think as I read the papers, I think most of them are taking a very cautious approach. Because, like you said, we're talking about microscale evidence here, right? So when you find you find microspherals that formed it, what did what did we find? You know, figure out two thousand some degrees. Four, yeah, four thousand. I thought the melting. Fahrenheit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Four thousand Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. How do you explain that? I mean, impact. I, I think that yes. One of the things we learned from Tunguska is that based upon the scorching pattern and the, uh, the amount of heat that was necessary, I think it was the Zonley paper that we were looking at, was basically thinking that it might have been, that the, the temperature of the Tunguska fireball might have been equivalent to the photosphere of the sun, like 10,000 degrees centigrade. So, I mean, clearly that's hot enough to, to trigger some kind of alchemy, some kind of exotic alchemy. And a lot mm. of the, the microspherals and, and things uh, have more the nature of the target rock than it, than the impactor itself, the, the, the hypothetical impactor. But anyways, 
getting back to this multi-proxy study of changing environmental conditions in, in Manitoba. What is interesting about that is because when you look at the, you've got, like I said, you've got Malcolm LeCompte right up there. He's the, he's the third author. The fourth author is James Kennett, and the fifth one is Alan West. So you've got LeCompte, Kennett, and West, which is kind of the, the big triumvirate of, you know, impact proponent scientists, along with James Teller, who's been doing all of this, to me, amazing work for decades on, you know, the paleohydrological landscapes of eastern and central North America. And now we see these ideas coming together. And, and so I think we'll use this Lake Hind, and I think it is Lake Hind. I, I, I believe I somewhere came across it as Lake Hind, not Hind. But anyways, Lake, so I'm going to call it Lake Hind until somebody corrects me. But um, so this Lake Hind study is going to be a very uh, useful bridge because that's what we're finding there is the connection between the microspheral and the, or the microscale deposits and evidence for catastrophic floods and, and glacial melting. And from there, we'll then segue into this whole question of this extraordinary sequence of melting events that took this planet from these gigantic ice caps swallowing up half of North America to, a, you know, a few thousand, six, seven thousand years later, they're gone. And uh, that raises some thorny questions. So that is actually, in a way, kind of how I came to the impact hypothesis in the first place, because I didn't find the, the existing, the prevailing explanations for the mega floods to be, uh, to be credible. And I still don't. Um, and I, I know we'll, 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 I've had several comments have been from defenders of the, what I would think of as the orthodoxy. Well, there was a big lake. There was an ice dam, and the ice dam gave way, and this is well established, and everybody agrees on it. You're some cock, crackpot contractor, and who would listen to you anyway, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but, um, but of course, what we'll do is when we get into it, we're we're gonna we're gonna look at that. We're gonna take it apart. We're gonna look at the evidence. I would be willing to bet, and I think Brad will agree with this. You'd be hard pressed to find somebody who has spent more time crisscrossing in the field, examining these landscapes of fluvial catastrophe on a broader scale than we have for 23, 24 years now. We've been going dozens of expeditions, you know, and it's taken us from Pennsylvania all the way out to Astoria, Washington at the mouth of the Columbia and all of this stuff in between. And, even the guys that are writing the papers and the paleohydrologists, uh, I'm going to guess a lot of them probably have not covered the territory we've covered. So all I'm saying is that maybe we're not as, uh, as, as woo-woo as people might want to think, as some people might want to think. So we have been talking about the Tunguska event. And one reason that we're talking about the Tunguska event is it, it may sort of become a, let's call it a mesoscale phenomena because we're kind of putting it in the middle of the ranking. Clearly it was something that people witnessed and experienced. We went through a litany of eyewitness reports, you know, trees are blown down, you know, 82 million trees are blown down, you know, uh, a reindeer herd is incinerated. People see gigantic fireballs and the sky splitting apart they think it's the end of the world. So clearly this is macro scale, but there's also micro scale. And part of that micro scale is, is now the basis for the really important studies that are going on right now and have been going on for the last couple of decades as far as trying to decipher and understand what the, um, the Tunguska event was all about. And we will come back and look at some of that interesting studies because we haven't even touched upon some of that. Um, the, the studies of genetic anomalies, which is very interesting to me. Um, but again, you know, we'll, we'll come, we'll circle back to that at, at some point because. So are we, are we leaving the Tunguska subject for now? Well, I thought we'd kind of segue over into fireball phenomena in general and look at a couple of other interesting examples in, in recent history. 
one of them is the great fireball procession of 1913. You guys have heard of that, I think, right? Is that right? You I've have heard you mention it. Yeah, oh, no, you've just heard, heard me mention it. Okay. Well, um, I've heard it. <laughs> you have heard it. <laughs> okay. Well, let's look at a few examples of some um, very interesting phenomena that people have witnessed. So if we want to talk now about getting away from stuff you have to look at under the microscope to stuff that you can actually see happening in the sky. Um, so here is, I, I love to go back into some of the old journals because the old journals would were really one of the things that they like to do was publish these accounts. I mean, you look at the old... Uh, astronomy journals and things, um, they're filled with these accounts of people, you know, witnessing things. This is, this is from 18, what I'm going to read to you parts of now is from 1899, Popular Astronomy. And this is on the night of August 7th, 1899, while observing the comet Temple. Now let's, wait, let's see, I have a, a list of comets here. Here we go. All right, so this is selected meteor streams uh, with data. And so this is not all the meteor streams, of course, but this is some of the ones that I think are the most interesting and important. Name of the stream down on the left, and then the, the comet who's, that they're associated with. So you have the quadrantids and, and their date of peak, January 4th, the Lyrids, April 22nd, Ada Aquarids, early May, Perseids peak August 12th to 15th. The Leonids peak November 17th. Uh, Draconids on October 7th to 9th. Geminids. And the cometary source, notice the Leonids are associated with Temple Tuttle. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't see meteors that are part of these particular meteor streams any other time of year except these. Um, because there is a random component to this, but generally we're going to use, usually if you see a, a, a meteor on April 22nd, it's probably going to be part of the Lyrid stream, which ultimately is associated with Comet Thatcher. And then we'll go back to um, what I was getting into. So on, on the night of August 7th, 1899, while observing the Comet Temple, 1899C, I was startled by a vivid illumination of the floor as if by a flash of lightning. Glancing up through the dome slit, so this is an astronomer, the dome slit is the, the slit in the, in the dome, you know, of an astronomical observatory. Okay. Um, glancing up through the dome slit, I saw a portion of the meteoric trail, which was very bright and narrow, and the color of Sirius. Five minutes after this apparition, I unexpectedly heard a loud rumbling, which sounded as if a couple of distant cannons had been fired in quick succession. Um, and Mr. John Nichols Jr. of Golden, Colorado, sent me the following information. About, one, tw about 20 minutes after 1 o'clock, this would have been in the morning, Mr. J.D. Williams of this place and myself were chatting on the street when suddenly the whole place became as light as day and we heard a loud rushing noise. Looking up, we beheld what seemed to be a big ball of fire rush through the heavens from the east to the west and bursting way in the west. In its first onward rush through the sky, it seemed to separate and leave behind it a kind of trail of fire. When the ball of fire rushed through the sky, it left behind a greenish tinge. Um, yeah. And then also from uh, Popular Astronomy, on, uh, nine, published in 1912, this was a meteor sighting on May 30th, 1911. About 7 o'clock p.m., the 30th of last May, I was standing in my yard facing west when a brilliant meteor caught my eye, which I will try to describe, though no words can carry an adequate picture of it to one who did not see it. It consisted distinctly of a head or nucleus and a long tail. The head, about three or four times the apparent diameter of the sun, showed a mass of intensely brilliant streaks and patches of fire, much like the effect of a bursting skyrocket. The stately, this stately meteoric train, steadily moving 
with perhaps one-fourth the annual velocity, the annular velocity of a shooting star, spurning both earth and sky and aimed at some unknown faraway point in space and never to be repeated in the experience of one lifetime will remain as long as earthly memory survives the most striking emblem of the majestic. Ah, I would have liked to have seen that. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I have a story sort of like that. I've been trying to look at uh, the comet that's in the sky right now, uh, Neowise. Yeah. And so um, up until recently, you had to, you know, in the Northern Hemisphere, you had to stay up late and or, or get up really early to see it in the before the sunrise. But the last couple of days, it's supposed to be becoming visible at dusk in the evening. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be getting higher and higher in the sky. Mm-hmm. So on the 12th, we were out trying to look for it right after right after the sun went down, you know, and the sky was getting darker and we're looking for it or whatever. And we didn't ever see the comet, but there was a meteor that came in that lit up the whole landscape and it mm. flashed two or three times before it went out and it was moving really quick. Now, I don't know if it was associated with this comet, obviously, but no, still, I, I, probably not, probably not, but no. it was, it's just a very similar story. You know, I'm looking mm-hmm. for a comet and then something comes into the atmosphere that lights up the, the ground. Uh-huh. Where you can like a lightning strike. Yeah. Yeah. It was so bright. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Here's, here's one from, uh, uh, an account from um, was published in May of 1916, but it occurred on. Let's see, this was a, yeah, this was a cowboy out on the range. I guess he was well. At least it was a guy out on the horse. He says, "I wish to report an observation of mine, of a brilliant fireball about 7 p.m. Uh, 1916, April 1st. It was one of the largest that I ever saw." was moving very slowly and seemed to leave portions of its substance in its trail in the form of sparks. It came from an easterly direction and moved almost due west. It was moving so slowly that I could easily see its nucleus. When I first saw its motion, when I first saw it, its motion was such that I unconsciously leaned over in my saddle for fear of it striking me. I heard no explosions nor any other sound, although I listened closely. I believe that when it vanished, it was less than a mile from my position. Remember how we talked about this kind of the illusionary aspect of these this phenomena, that people think that it's so close to them? That thing was probably 20 miles up in the atmosphere, but he leans over on his horse because he thinks it's gonna that it might strike him. Um here is um, another uh, account from Popular Astronomy and that was published in 1926. And this was uh, regarding two sets of fireball sightings, one November 15th and one December 29th, 1925. In the morning papers of November, November 16th, 1925, the fall of a remarkable bright daylight meteor somewhere in New England was reported. When the observer's stations were plotted on a map of New England, The points were dense about Boston and thinned out from there in all directions. The object itself was described as a glowing, glaring ball of golden fire, which dragged a bright tail after it. It plunged sharply downward, east to north, and many observers said that it either vanished or exploded above the horizon in eastern Massachusetts. Many in widely separated places were confident that they saw it drop to earth within a few miles or a few rods. So this is over and over again. Again, part of that sort of the the, the perspective thing of this. You know, they're thinking, oh, it just fell over the next hill. You know, but it actually might have been 100 miles away. And I've seen enough fireballs that, you, you, you know, you, you can kind of see how that is, you know. And, that, and I've told you about my grandfather when he was a boy in Sweden seeing the thing that he described to me. And he told me this story a bunch. That's why I still remember it but saw something like a fiery beam come over his head and then fall in. He was, I think he said he was fishing and it was winter if I'm recalling right. So he might've had a hole in the ice or I don't remember if it was when, I don't remember the season. The story was too long ago. He said it was like 
a flaming beam, a beam, and that's the word he used, he described it, came over his head and then plunged into the lake. Now, I don't know if it plunged into the lake or, you know, it might have in Sweden, there's some pretty big lakes. So, I mean, if it had been a mile or two miles across, he might have thought it plunged into the lake, but it didn't really. Um, but I remember him telling me that story because he, he never got tired of telling that story because that was undoubtedly his one big eyewitness experience of, of some kind of a cosmic phenomena. And later on, as I read accounts, and I remember as a kid, I was like, so pug, what would that be? You know, what in the world did you see? Um, and of course he, he didn't really know what it was, but, but in retrospect, having read many, many, many eyewitness accounts now, I go, well, that's pretty certain. That's what he saw was, was a meteor. Um, Let's see. So then another account from January 1928, also popular astronomy. Uh, flocks, flocks of fireballs. Last August, someone reported in local newspapers sights of one of these large meteors lasting long enough to make a streak of fire across most of the sky. A published note by Dr. Fisher asking for more information, brought 249 replies from persons who thought they had seen this same ball of fire. The truth, however, was even more interesting. A study of these reports convinced Dr. Fisher that what his informants had seen was really a flock of these celestial visitors. Not one of them. Meteors seen on October 16th are disclosed by similar public reports to have consisted of at least 12 separate objects, all of which must have been traveling through space in a more or less close-packed group, and all of which encountered the Earth and burned up in its atmosphere at approximately the same instance. It is not impossible that these observations introduce a new concept in astronomy the concept of what might be called minor comets. Single meteors are already well known and are believed to be tiny bits of iron or stone, probably no larger than a small nut, which hit the atmosphere, burn up, and form shooting stars. Comets are believed to consist of somewhat similar materials, but with the particles gathered together in flocks to make the comet's head or nucleus. It is probable that some of the particles in these cometary heads are much larger than those that form ordinary shooting stars. The flocks of fireballs, which Dr. Fisher's observations disclose, may be intermediate between the single meteors and the groups of meteoric particles numerous enough to be visible as comets. And here's another interesting, and of course, this is what was, what did I say, 1926 for this? So, yeah, obviously, our understanding of, of a cometary, the structure of a cometary nucleus has come a long way since then. But what we still have is a model of a very loose aggregate that can disaggregate quite readily and produce multiple uh, objects, right, from a single cometary nucleus. And this is something that we'll explore uh, in more in depth um, in the future, because there's a lot of this kind of stuff, which um, at first glance wouldn't seem to you know, make a, a rational connection. But but who knows? So this is from uh, August, September, 1928. Uh, so this was a, uh, a an account in a newspaper that appeared in Tennessee. So there was an unusually brilliant meteor. It was preceded by a small tornado, hail, and rainstorms in South Georgia. Oh, the paper was in Tennessee, but the, the event was in South Georgia. Uh, preceded by a small tornado, hail and rainstorms in South Georgia, a fiery meteor described as larger than a house flashed through the skies from way across Georgia to Charleston, South Carolina, about midnight last night to end in an explosion that shook buildings and awakened hundreds of people in towns along the route. The celestial phenomena was visible over an area approximately 400 miles square, 200 miles on either side of the flash. People attributed shocks felt in their homes to an earthquake. But United States Weather Bureau officials said 
that there had been no earth disturbance in the southern states and that the tremor was caused by the explosion of the meteor in all probability. But in the, in the uh, aftermath of Tunguska and those accounts, you know, it certainly does seem like there is a, uh, a, a terrestrial component you know, and we can remember the description of people feeling, uh, you know, shock waves passing into ground, the, the sound, the sonic effects of, of something passing under the ground that they described, like many freight trains all passing at once. And there was a, a 5.5 actually registered earthquake. So it's very possible that this explosion actually did produce tremors that were felt. Now, we also, and we didn't get into it much, but we touched upon the correlation between the Tunguska event and, and a response in your geomagnetic field, which would be something that would certainly be worth exploring in more gr greater detail. But the thing that intrigues me here is this association with, with some unusual weather. Um, and this is something else that we find, again, uh, showing up in a lot of accounts, even going back to ancient accounts of cosmic and celestial phenomena and its association with unusual weather. Now, could there be an interlink, you know, could there be some events like this, um, Earth geomagnetic field and what's going on with the atmosphere? I don't, I would not rule that out. Yeah, it said it was a hailstorm and a, what do they say, a tornado? A tornado, hail, and rainstorms. Hmm. Okay, but it it must have been after that, right? I mean, you wouldn't yeah, see yeah. a comp, yeah, okay. Right, right, right. In this case, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's a purely coincidence. But right. there are a, quite a few accounts where you will see these associations between something in the heaven and something on the earth over and over mm. again. You know, there's an earthquake. This is this was common. Unusual weather that seems to be common as well. So that's something that we'll 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 look into. I think it's worth uh, looking till uh, looking in uh, greater detail. And then. Um, now we're going to jump forward to 1993, the Journal of Geophysical Research. And uh, three, I think they're probably astronomers, Robert T. Dodd. This was in the, uh, Stephen F. Wolf and Michael E. Lipschutz, or Lipschutz who wrote this article uh, about the, what the H. chondrite stream, chondrites are a type of meteor body. Um, until recently, there seemed to be little point in seeking order in the distribution of meteor falls, meteorite falls. On one hand, it appeared certain that the process that bring meteorites to the earth, namely impact and gravitational perturbation, would scatter them, destroying all dynamic evidence for their sources. On the other hand, there was no astronomical evidence that either meteoroids or their source objects approach the earth in order. However, the situation has changed dramatically in recent years with the observations of streams of radar meteors of asteroidal origin, dense fireballs, and Amor asteroids. Additional evidence, and while we're at it, uh, Kyle, look up AMOR asteroids. Okay. Additional evidence of order in the distribution of objects near the Earth comes from analysis of lunar seismic records and simultaneous very low frequency radio propagation anomalies in the Earth's atmosphere. Ah, so we might have some connection possibly there. That might be pointing. So um, what he's getting at here is they're going from a model of just ran pure randomness with no order to it, no structure to the to the uh, pattern of impacts to this idea, no, that there may be an ordered structure to it. Uh, there may, in fact, be a periodicity. Um, goes on to say, oh, did you find Amor asteroids? Yes, uh, the Amor asteroids are a group of near-Earth asteroids named after the archetype object 1221 Amor. Mm -hmm. uh, the orbital perihelion of these objects is close to but greater than the orbital aphelion of Earth. Aphelion is the opposite opposite of perihelion. So perihelion, close to the sun, aphelion, far away from the sun. So in Earth's elliptical orbit about the sun, it, it's going to be closer, roughly, what, 2 million miles closer at its perihelion than at its aphelion? 
Mm. Something yeah. in that range. So it's saying that these asteroids, their closest approach to the sun is a little bit farther out than Earth's farthest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from the and sun. And they, uh, they cross the orbital path of Mars. Yeah, they're in uh-huh. the Mars's orbit. Yeah. Okay. We have de- He goes on to say, we have demonstrated that the Earth encountered a significant concentration of falls, meteorite falls, in May between 1855 and 1895. More recent May falls may also belong to the cluster, but we cannot now either prove or disprove this. Um, the only plausible explanation for a concentration of falls that persists for at least 40 years is an encounter with a stream of meteoroids. In view of Halliday et al.'s 1990 observation that some contemporary fireball producing meteoroids approach the Earth in streams, it is not surprising to find that historic meteorite falls did so as well. That said, many aspects of the stream components reported here are more or less unexpected, right? Because what we're seeing is the shift now from from a, a random model of these encounters to a much more structured model where there might be a periodicity. And rather than isolated random encounters with meteorites, there may now be what they're talking about here, streams, streams of meteors. Um, the identification, they go on, the identification of meteorites that traveled together in space raises many questions and opens new windows for research. Among old and vexing issues on which studies of meteorite streams may shed light are the nature, number, and structures of meteorite parent bodies, the meaning of exposure ages for fragmentation histories of meteorite source objects, and the history, uh, that is, the constancy or inconstancy of the meteoroid flux. Clearly, the existence of streams of Earth-approaching meteoroids also has implications for calculations of the likelihood of life-threatening impacts on our planet. For such studies can no longer assume that the meteoroid flux is random. Now, I think this is a critically important shift in our understanding of, of, of the nature of the near-Earth environment. This shifting to the idea that there may be clustered events, there may be streams that would increase the probabilities of encounters above and beyond the background random count, maybe by orders of magnitude. So let us go to the great meteor stream uh, fireball procession of 1913. And I'm thinking this would probably be a good place for a break, right? Yeah. Sure would. Yeah. Good place. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Uh, Before we're going to dive back into the great fireball procession of 1913 um randall you wanted to talk about this cdb oil cbd oil yeah i mentioned it last week um our our cohort in all of this uh mike robertson asked me to to try the stuff and i've tried like three kinds of cbd oil um and i started on this what i just started last episode i think i'd been doing it about two days and he wanted me to report if I felt any benefits. And I said, well, I will report benefits if I experience what I think are benefits. Okay. Um, and so I would report that, yes, I think I am experiencing, but I think I've had uh, really, I think it's really helped my sleep because I have a tendency to wake up at night and sometimes lay awake there for anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour, finally go back to sleep. Um, and then when it's time to get up, you know, if I've woken up twice and laid there awake, then then I've got a sleep deficit all day. But I have noticed this last week that I've been sleeping really good. Um, is it the CBD oil? I don't know. But that's what I've been doing different. And the other thing is, is lifting weights. I've got inflammation in my hips. 
and in my knees, particularly my knees, because I spent so much work in my working life down on my knees, you know, swinging a hammer, doing this or that, you know, so my knees have taken a, a beating. But mm. I've noticed also that I can been lifting weights this last week without my lower back going nuts um, and uh, getting up out of bed in the morning without stiffness in my knees. So those two things I have definitely noticed. Now, CBD oil, I don't know. But if I go back and go, what have I been doing different? Pretty much that's the only thing I've been doing different. So I think I'm confident now enough in this product to, to endorse it. But I'm going to continue to use it. And, and if I experience con considerable be benefits, because I do believe the research I've done is that CBD oil is like almost like a miracle substance. So for me, it was like, okay, I want to start getting on some CBD oil and, and, and uh, reap the benefits of it. But what is the brand? So that's when I got presented with this. And it is um, CBD from the gods. And like I said last week, the thing about it that made it uh, special to me was the fact that, you know, as I showed you last week, they, they used um, in their logo, they used an image of, of me. <laughs> back back that's in the, right you remember yeah oh, well, that, hey, well, I, I, I was <laughs> i was known as apollo then i've i've changed my name but and i put on and i put on about 40 50 pounds <laughs> and my my recurve bow is in the closet but yeah I'm, <laughs> see now that i'm lifting late weights again watch out this guy is coming back <laughs> So anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm at this point actually confident that, that this might be the CBD oil that, uh, that I'm going to really try. Cause I've, so I've, how do you, I mean, so you just, it's like a dropper bottle or something. Yeah, you just put, I take, uh, I've been experimenting with a half a dropper full and a dropper full. So, you know, like there, a night before you go to bed. Dropper. Yeah. But I did it the other day, a half, a, a half a dropper full before I went to a meeting and I noticed I seem to get very calm and focused, which is exactly what Mike Robertson said would happen if I did it during the day. So that's my main experience with it at this point. I've got the one episode where I did do it in the middle of the day before this meeting. So I'm going to try that again. Um, but as he says, that it, the C, it's almost like the CBD has a mind of its own and it knows what you need at that moment that you take it. So I, a lot more research and I've got some salve too, that I've only tried once, but that's going to become part of my regimen, um, over the next week as well. So by next, uh, next episode, I'm going to have tried this stuff, particularly on my knees and my lower back where I have the, the most inflammation. But I think that's one of the touted benefits of CBD oil, right? That it, it, uh, uh, mitigates inflammation of various kinds. Right. Right. And we've been on the road enough. For me to know that you have trouble sleeping, yeah. And if, and if you've and you've tried many things over the years or over the decades, even now we've been traveling around. So if you yeah. found something that allows you to sleep, I mean that's uh, that's a good thing. Uh, you can it's isolate a very good it and thing. Figure, figure out that that's that's what's yes. doing it, man. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll see. Um, but yeah, at this point, what can I say? I mean, I've been doing it for a week. Um, really had some great sleep. And I can't think of anything else that I've done different, you know? So anyways, we'll, right we're, I'm going to keep, keep working with it and see what happens. Um, Cause yeah, I'm just, I, I, I'm, to me, this is one of the positives is that we're discovering, you know, the hemp plant and, and the, 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 the endocannabinoid system and all these new medical possibilities to me are, are, is at least something to be optimistic about. Okay, so we were going to talk about the great meteor procession of 1913. And, uh, yeah, let's see here. So this is from an article that appeared in the Journal of the British Astronomical Association in 1930, 1913, entitled, An Extraordinary Meteoric Display. At about 9.30 p.m. on the 9th of February, 1913, there suddenly appeared in the northwestern sky a fiery red body, which quickly grew larger as it came nearer and which was then seen to be followed by a long tail. 
Some observers uh, said the tail seemed like the glare from the open door of a furnace. To others, it was like the illumination from a searchlight. To others, like the stream of sparks blown away from a burning chimney by a strong wind. The body moved forward on a perfectly horizontal path with peculiar, majestic, dignified deliberation. And continuing its course, it moved on to the southeast where it disappeared in the distance. But before the astonishment aroused by this first meteor had subsided, other bodies were seen coming from the northwest, emerging from precisely the same place as the first one. Onward they moved, at the same deliberate pace, in twos and threes, with tails streaming behind. They all traversed the same path and headed for the same point in the southeast. Gradually, the bodies became smaller until the last ones were but red sparks, some of which were snuffed out before they reached their destination. As to the number of bodies, there was a great diversity of statement. The usual estimate was from 15 to 20, but others said 60 to 100, and even others said that there were thousands. The entire time occupied by the display was about three minutes. Just as the bodies were vanishing, there was heard in many places a rumbling sound like thunder. The stretch of country over which the display was seen is unprecedented. In the present case, persons dwelling 2,500 miles apart saw the same bodies. Moreover, the descriptions furnished by observers in Bermuda, in Ontario, and in Saskatchewan do not materially differ. Observations of the size of the bodies were very discordant, but there is sufficient evidence to show that they were of considerable size. Several observers considered the leading body to have a diameter equal to that of the full moon, or nearly so. One observer estimated that of the full moon and another at one-fifteenth of the moon's diameter. The last estimate gives a real diameter of 123 feet. The largest bodies were at least 100 feet in diameter. The tail of the largest meteor is estimated to have been 39 miles long. Let's ponder this for a minute. And as we're doing it, let's uh, take a look at a painting that was done at the time uh, or, or shortly thereafter by uh, Gustav Hahn of the Great Meteor Procession of 1913. So now, notice if, if from the observers, and of course, obviously, the closer you are, the larger it's going to appear. But the the from the various perspectives of the, the observers, you've got estimates from one fifteenth. What did it say? One fifteenth of the diameter of the moon um, to half the full moon to a diameter equal to the full moon. So then it's estimated that there were, you know, perhaps dozens, dozens of these objects, and that many of them were more than a hundred feet in diameter. Well. That puts those objects in the Tunguska size range, doesn't it? What was Chelyabinsk? Yeah. 50, 60 feet in diameter, Tunguska 140 to 150. So this procession may have, we don't know, but it may have contained or included multiple objects the size of Tunguska or maybe even larger. Well, that has some rather interesting implications, doesn't it? Here's a, here's a map that was drawn at the time. This was done by an astronomer who, who took all of the eyewitness accounts and plotted the path. And this is what he came up with. You can see here it's coming down. It's just difficult to see. It's coming down here over Lake Superior. See up here, it's, it's first being observed up in Saskatchewan. 
And then it comes down. It was observed in Manitoba, Manitoba. It was observed in the Dakotas. You can see that the pathway leads it over uh, northern Minnesota, over Lake Superior. And then it's coming down here and comes very close to Montreal. And then look here. Dead on passes right over New York. Now, think about this, 1913. This object undoubtedly came in and became like a almost like a sublunar satellite of the Earth for a little while. You know, it finally disappeared down somewhere over the ocean. It was, it was witnessed by, by uh, sailors uh, out at sea. So, I mean, this is how the pathway of 2,500 miles was calculated. Yeah, it says Saskatchewan to Bermuda. Saskatchewan to Bermuda, but it was actually a thing seen beyond Bermuda ah. uh, by, a, uh, you know, by these, these sailors at sea. So, so, so this would be a really low angle. Is that what you're saying? They would have actually, it would actually have been close to being in orbit. Yes. That's what right. I'm saying. Okay. Wow. But imagine if the angle had been ever so slightly steeper. Yeah. Now, what have you got? 1913 over the Great Lakes region, over New England, multiple Tunguska sized events yeah. directly over New York city. You think 20th century hi history might have been somewhat altered if that had actually happened? A little different. A little, a little different, different, I would say, yes. <laughs> so this is a very interesting case study right here. And it opens the door to some rather unnerving possibilities. Do you think that was the, I mean, I, I know nobody has the answer to this, but do you think that was the main object or was this just pieces of something? Oh, I think it was probably, yeah, it was probably an object that came in Fragmented and, and, and fragmented, mm. or maybe was even fragmenting before it entered the earth. Pick, remember, Shoemaker Levy nine, right? I yeah, because those look like clusters in that painting. He was showing clusters of objects right next to each other. Yeah, yeah. And let's go back to, um, I think I have a Shoemaker Levy nine right here. And yeah, here we go. Yeah. So I'm thinking this kind of probably gives us the closest example of what it might have been as a, a mini version of this right here. And of course, this was originally one object that became 21 separate objects. And if it hadn't collided with Jupiter on this particular next passage, 21 objects might have become hundreds of smaller objects. Now, I think a lot of these objects were estimated in the kilometer size range. So if that being the case, then any one of these objects could perhaps supply hundreds of thousands of Tunguska-sized objects. So see, that's what I think is what we really need to be looking at in terms of planetary defense. Because, yeah, I mean, the dinosaur killers are very real. You know, a six-mile asteroid slamming into the Earth. You know, mass mortality, extinction level event, planetary extinction level event. Obviously, a planetary extinction level event is going to wipe out civilization completely. Any survivors of such an event are going to be living a Stone Age existence because there's not going to be no such thing anymore as a supply chain. There's not going to be any radio communications with anyone. There's not going to be any satellite. All of that's gone, right? Um, but we're talking about, you know, something that's very not not impossible, but very improbable. But what is far more probable is when we get down to a Tunguska scale event, which were it to happen today over a populated area would be a hell of a significant event. You know, because look, what, what, you know, if one of these objects that we just talked about in the procession of 1913 came in and it was the size of Tunguska and it detonated above New York, you know, you're, you're talking instantly a million people are dead and there would be no catastrophe like, I mean, in or, you know, you could have a world war for five years and get a million people dead, but you're not going to get a million people dead in a matter of a minute or a few minutes from anything, any event in recent history. But a Tunguska event over a densely populated area of the globe happening now would instantly produce hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of deaths and in, in three or four times that many injuries. So even a small cosmic event would be very significant in terms of its 
consequences, um, would certainly have economic ramifications that would probably take years to, to, to recover from. In fact, something like that could actually make this whole COVID thing look rather insignificant. But what we kind of know, I think at this point, is that the evidence for such events may be way more prolific than anybody had really imagined, you know, a couple of generations ago. And this is why we need to be really much more uh, cosmically conscious about our, the nature of our cosmic environment. It's just like, you know, if an explorer is going into an unexplored area of, of forest or jungle or wilderness, you got to have certain skills. You know, you, know you, you need to know the lay of the land. You know, need to know where the dangers lie. You need to know where the, the resources are that you would need to survive, right? So learning how to survive, for example, in the Canadian Arctic is not going to be the same as learning how to survive in the Brazilian rainforest. But basically, overall, you've got to learn the specifics of the environment in order to have any idea or clue at all about how you would go about surviving in such an environment. Well, we are in a cosmic environment and it's very likely that history exists now for the last 4,500 years or so because of the fact that we've been in an interval where relatively speaking, the cosmos has not been highly active as it has been uh, in throughout the, 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 the lifetime of our planet as well as the lifetime of humans on this planet. And that's why I keep coming back to the Younger Dryas as, as being so incredibly important because the Younger Dryas does appear to be the most significant event that involved this planet in literally millions of years. Well, that being the case, what makes it not doubly unique is the fact that our ancestors were living on the planet at the time and they managed to survive it. You know, in terms of survival of the fittest, it may have been survival of the luckiest. You know, it may have been as much that as anything, because in the nature of the event and what we're finding out, and, and, and this is why we're going to keep exploring, because look, we've studies are coming out within the last couple of years showing, you know, this, this new study of, um, that I pointed out earlier, um, you know, the uh, Central Europe. And the Alps appears to have been blasted by the cosmic events and left the fingerprints strewn all over the Alps and all over Germany and, 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 and Poland and areas like that. And this is now coming to light. And so this first um, article that I've been reading here is uh, a study of lake cores taken from uh, cores taken from the body of a lake in what was formerly Czechoslovakia. And what do you think they're finding right at the Younger Dryas boundary? huge amounts of, uh, of uh, proxies for some type of a cosmic event. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so we're, I imagine for as long as we're doing this podcast, we will be talking about some of the same themes and same issues because they're not resolved at this point. And, and every year, every few months, in fact, is bringing out new research, lending, uh, shedding light on these extremely important events. How, how would we, um, this is another question that maybe nobody has the answer to, but how would we sort of start mapping objects that are, you know, because most of the NEOs they talk about that they're looking for are a kilometer in, in diameter right. or more. If, right. we're, if, you know, if we got, if we realize, well, wait a minute, Tunguska was, you know, 175 feet, that's a lot smaller. Uh, how are we going to track those objects or find them in the first place? They're uh, almost impossible to see. You got space well, radar? Yes. Or something? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I would think that, I would like to see that perhaps we've got uh, tracking radar um, yeah. on the moon would be a great place. Uh, great. That'd be one, one purpose for a moon base. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we need to be tracking and mapping and, you know, it's going to be in, in kind of way, it's going to be kind of like a parallel to what uh, Kenneth and West and LeCompte and those guys are doing, looking for this microspheral evidence, because what we saw from the studies was, well, you have these guys who are skeptics. Well, they didn't look in the right place. You know, if you don't look in the right place, you're not going to find it. But it's, it's, it's a tedious process to, to first to locate the boundary layer where the proxies might be, then to isolate the proxies to the extent where you can actually begin to measure them, that you actually can begin to analyze them, and so on. You know, we, we, we've talked about that, that some of the protocols necessary 
to extract. And so we were talking about, you know, things like the sieve size and the aliquot or sample size. And now if you deviate really even from the slightest uh, in the pro the protocols, you might miss, you might miss the evidence. You might miss the layer of nano diamonds, you know, because it's, it's a very thin, discrete layer where it was the surface of the earth. When this stuff came down, it's been buried and it's in that thin layer. And if you, you know, if you're a couple of inches above or a couple of inches below, you might miss it. But it, I think it's going to be the same kind of very detailed, incisive examination, exploration of our cosmic neighborhood. We're going to begin to find the, 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 the sub-kilometer objects. It's really what we need to be looking for. We need to be looking for those that are 100, 200, 300 feet in, diam 300 feet in diameter. And they're detectable. I mean, but you just have to be looking in the right place at the right time. And so I think we just why I say step number one, much more vigorous observation program is one of the things that's called for. Because aren't a lot of the aren't a lot of the commentary ones on like elliptical orbits. So they spend a lot of time yeah. really far away from us. Yeah. Yeah. And see, that's the thing about the Tunguska, and that's what one of the next important lessons we're going to learn from Tunguska is that circumstantial evidence would suggest that it was part of the torrid meteor stream. Right. Yeah. And, and what, what are the two primary things that, that, that suggest that as a possibility? The time of year that it, that it came in. That's one. number one. Yep. <laughs> to you, Russ. <laughs> number two. All right. Two, let's I'm... pass this one off to Russ. <laughs> Man. Okay, guys. All right. I'm... There's going to be a lot of flack over this. <laughs> I think you guys have just partially redeemed yourselves. <laughs> Is it that it came out of the sun? Is that the uh, other part? Well, of it? It, it, because if it's it's the point in space from which it, it the radiant point, the radiant right. point, yes, okay. the radiant point was was very very close to the radiant point of the the beta torrids. Uh, okay, yes. at that time of day, uh, at that it. time of year, teamwork. So it's it's <laughs> it's two things. It's the timing of it and where it's the space where it was in space, where it was in time, where it was in space. All right. And both of those things are consistent with it being a member of the Tard Street. That doesn't prove that it was a member of the Tard Street, but it says it, it makes a strong circumstantial case that it was. Now, if we can find micro scale, micro proxy evidence of Tunguska and analyze it, and we can compare that to analysis of other known Tard meteors, hey, we might be able to really make that circumstantial case might much stronger. And in fact, there may be some work like that being done by some of the Russians that I haven't been privy to yet, but is still out there. Um, and if I was maybe four people instead of just one, I probably would have already looked at it. But regrettably, <laughs> what uh, about what about clouds of dust? Like, are, wouldn't that be dangerous too? If if uh, oh yeah yeah, I mean it, it it's not going to make an impact, but it can come down as heat, right? If it's enough, if it's thick enough material. Well, yeah, and then if it causes fires. Now, the Tunguska That's, event was not enough. It did have, see, this is in other studies. The, the Tunguska event had measurable effects on the Earth's ozone uh, layer. That needs uh, to be investigated, and, and we can talk about that at some point when we've circled back around, because we are going to circle back around and come back to some of the other things about Tunguska. Because, like, as I said, um, you know, I showed a slide there, uh, I think, last week, where we briefly, just briefly, um, looked at some of the uh, some of the evidence, the two different kinds of evidence that um, relative to the to Tunguska and uh, let's see here I should have it right. Yeah, yes. okay, so this is an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'll do the share screen and so these these were, as I'm saying here, this was the observed characteristics. And we went through this last week, so we won't spend a lot of time. But some of the, the very interesting things, the sky opens up, fire pours out, sky split in two, deafening thunder, extremely loud crashes, bangs, etc. The subterranean trembling and shaking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But then there's a whole other set of secondary effects associated with the Tunguska event that are, would, would definitely be worth diving into. The anomalous, which we talked about a little bit here, the anomalous optical and atmospheric effects, the white night sky glows, but what was causing the intense and prolonged solar halos uh, and subsequent intense precipitation events over Europe, 
Was there a connection there? You know, there was a de decrease in atmospheric transparency detected in the U.S. What was what was causing that decrease in atmospheric uh, a transparency? And this is very interesting, worth getting into here, but not tonight. Disturbances in the points of neutral polarization in the scattering of sunlight, which is a, an indication of atmospheric turbulence. So the takeaway from this is that that in the days after the Tunguska, we actually see in, in the U.S. there was effects. Now, to what extent were those effects connected or not? Or was it just coincidental that you had intense precipitation, that you had a decrease in atmospheric transparency, that you had this, this uh, secondary effect of increased atmospheric turbulence? Magnetic microspherals deposits, deposited in regional soils. So that is going to tell us something about the nature of this interloper. The enhancement of carbon-13 and iridium in peat layers associated with the catastrophe. Extremely rapid recovery of forest. Accelerated growth of trees. I'm, you know, what's, why? A sharp increase in genetic mutations of plants. And then I have in uh, parentheses, question mark, animals in the catastrophe area. Now, a lot of that work has been in Russian, and so it's not that accessible to uh, English-speaking readers, but some of it is, and I've accessed that, but I haven't had a chance to, to digest it yet. But that could all, all be, you know, these are all things that are going to be worthy of deeper investigation. Um, so, yeah, I will stop share there. And uh, like I said, these secondary consequences raise a lot of interesting questions. And I'm particularly well, interested in this. The, 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 see, and it, this is the thing. If there was measurable atmospheric turbulence, could that then, of course, be connected to the fact that there was intense precipitation? Uh, mm -hmm. Unexpected, intense precipitation. And what was the connection with the anomalously light or white nights all over Europe? Where, like they said, for, the, for two nights afterwards, people went out and were wondering, what the hell is going on? Because there was no night. Was how what's the connection there? How do you explain that? Well, there are a number of explanations. I don't know which one is right, but obviously, what even something as small as Tunguska has effects rippling way beyond just the periphery of, of immediate catastrophe. What would happen under, say, if you had Tunguska size, uh, Tunguska times 10 or times 100? You know, what if the great meteor procession was, in fact, several dozen Tunguska-sized objects, and rather than coming parallel to the Earth's orbit, see, it's likely that what we're seeing there, and almost in effect, is something coming in and getting captured temporarily in Earth's orbit, but almost in a way doing like skipping off the Earth's yeah. atmosphere. It's skipped. Because, yeah, that's what I was going to yeah, ask you. Yeah, that's but had it come in at a slightly steeper angle, consequences of it could have been completely different. And let's suppose that you had a, an event of Tunguska times 10 or Tunguska times 100. How much would, could you magnify those secondary consequences? In addition, yeah. obviously, to the, to the immediate destruction that would be caused. So, so also, you had pointed out that, that, you know, it's equivalent to a 15 megaton bomb or something, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there have been tests done that are above that level right with the bomb yes so and these were tests where the bomb was above ground on a tower or something like that so why didn't that create luminous nights and halos around the sun and all or did it well to some extent yeah there were a host of secondary consequences and we're going to devote a couple of episodes to looking at the whole nuclear testing era because yeah. there were there are so many lessons to be gleaned from that. I know that one of the comments that came in after one of our presentation where I was showing to, to try to give some sense of the scale, the magnitude of the power released. I don't know what, what he was saying. That uh, what was it again? Was I glorifying that nuclear weapon? I, I don't remember, but it was something. No. He clearly missed the point, um, yeah. which was, look, that nuclear testing had happened. It's part of our history. Right. It happened while I was growing up. 
scared the shit out of me and a lot of other people who are my age, right? Coming up. Um, but the point is, is that many of the lessons and a lot of this information and in science has only become declassified within the last decade, but it has tremendous ramifications for gaining a better understanding of, of cosmic events like the Tunguska cosmic event of 1908. Because where we showed early on, where did you see the same kind of melt glass? We showed the examples between uh, the tr uh, Trinitite, which was the, the melt glass from the, the first plutonium bomb uh, detonation in, 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 New, in New Mexico, and the Libyan desert glass, right? We find, where do we find nanodiamonds in nuclear explosions? Where do we find the, the, the microspheral, see? So by looking at the, new, the explosions and knowing, for example, here's the force of a, of a 15 megaton explosion. 15 million tons of TNT will have a radius of destruction of this much. It can knock over, it'll have a, 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 an atmospheric pressure of X amount when it reaches a radius of Y, right? And it'll have, I mean, we saw that, that, that the, some of these larger ones can actually punch holes right through the atmosphere, right? So that's one of the consequences. There's, there's a lot of knowledge and insight that can be gained from looking at those tests. And, and it is that, to do that is not to glorify the tests. I mean, they happen. They're part of the history. So let's learn everything we can from them, right? So for many reasons. For one thing, uh, you know, there's a generation now that doesn't really know. They, that's not on their radar screens. Yet here we are headed right into another Cold War with both Russia and China, and we've got, right, I don't know what's happening in Russia, but, you know, we've got a 10-year nuclear upgrade plan that's going to cost a few trillion dollars to come up with a new generation of nuclear weapons. Um, you know, nobody's talking about that. Nobody at all. Who's talking about that, right? Well, if this was the 1950s and we were talking about a nuclear, a 10-year nuclear upgrade or even the 1980s, when Reagan came in, he was talking about we're going to go through this nuclear modernization. Right, that was big news. People were talking about it. Well, we're doing the same thing right now. Nobody is talking about it. Nobody is considering the implications of a whole new arms race, a whole new armament race of basically nuclearized weapons that are, for the most part, out of all computerized and out of the hands, out of the control of the hands of individual operators. This is a big deal. People should be talking about it. So I have no reluctance to say, look, there are things we need to learn from going back and looking both at atmospheric testing and, and, and below ground nuclear testing, because, you know, and, and what we learned from that, we can apply directly to understand, to a, getting a greater insight into cosmic phenomena. Uh, one, of, one of the other points of that, Randall, of course, was the, the scale where human technology and explosive abilities has kind of maxed out. Yeah. You know, that's just at the lowest level of what the cosmos is creating when there's a, a geocosmic event. Yes. That's, you know? yeah. So Good that's point, another Ray. point of that. It is another point. If we have, if we start looking at scaling relate ratios, we get up to, you know, 15 to 55. I think Zarbamba was 55 megatons. Biggest one ever, but just monstrously huge. Um, but yeah, once we're at that level, we're at the bottom end of the cosmic scale. So Tunguska represents a baby, right? 100, 100, 150 feet. We're looking at a 15 megaton explosion, which is the largest, you know, Castle Bravo, largest nuclear, above ground nuclear test by the American military, right? So we get that largest nuclear explosion of the American military during the nuclear testing era, right? And all of that below it from, from multi-kiloton, like, you know, Hiroshima is what, 10 to 15 kiloton, you know, but now we're up in the, which is thousands of tons of TNT up into the range of millions of tons of TNT, right? But once we get to the top range of the, of the anthropogenic scale, now we're at the bottom of the cosmos. That's Brad's point. And I yeah. think that's, that's an important point. But why could we use better weaponry to help you say, destroy some of the objects that are a hundred feet in diameter? I mean, I know I've heard people say it's not a good idea to blow these things up as they're coming in because then that just might make more of them. Exactly. And but that's a valid small, point. 
but for a smaller object that that is a tunguska like object maybe we could blow that into small enough pieces yeah but you know what's better is that see tunguska was probably ping-ponging between jupiter and the earth for you know centuries a long time yeah and you know obviously in 19 find it long before yeah so that's what I'm saying is, is we, we take an inventory of these objects and identify as many of them as we can. And then we, we come up with a hierarchical designation, which they've a- actually already doing. What are the most dangerous ones? But I think, you know, the, the, the dangerous ones right now are the ones that are actually extinction level triggers. What I'm saying we need to be looking at is the much smaller range of stuff that where we would be talking about taking out a major urban area or maybe a state where, you know, you might have a million to 10 million casualties because some, you know, a, a planet killer is going to be rare enough that that's probably not our, to be an immediate concern to us. You know, something a la Armageddon with Bruce Willis going, right, and, yeah. you know, all of that, <laughs> that's not the likely scenario. I mean, it could happen, but even there, that was. And that most was, likely we'd see that long in advance, long in advance. Yes. And the chances so of like, just randomly coming out of deep space and, and targeting earth is so remote. What we're actually going to be looking at is objects that are already part of the solar system that are orbiting, you know, the sun, usually Jovian or trans Jovian or sub Jovian in, in, in elliptical orbits that become earth crossers. And, you know, again, my thing is that to me, the greatest danger is going to be flocks of Tunguska objects. Yeah. That's where we need a whole bunch of serious weapons to blow them all out of the sky. <laughs> well, yeah. Or, you know, it just depends on what, what kind of infrastructure we have in space. I mean, right now we're pretty vulnerable, but 10, 20 years from now, we could be in a different you know, a different place if, if the will was there, you know, and at this point I'm not holding out a lot of hope because it's just like I said, I, people's consciousness seems to have just become more and more constricted all the time rather than becoming expansive and saying, Hey, we are part of this incredible, wondrous, uh, amazing, but dangerous cosmic world. And now if we're going to survive and, 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 subsist as a civilization we need to start thinking in cosmic terms you know back in the 80s it was what was it um think globally act locally i kind of think for the 21st century we need to think cosmically act globally it, it, we're at the point now where we have to start thinking in terms of the cosmos and that the fact that the earth is part of a solar system with a variable sun with a uh, a, a, a drastically modulating flux of uh of cosmic material that can affect the earth, um, possible other things that could be affecting the earth on a, on a galactic level. Even we don't, I don't think we should rule that out. Um, because there may be a galactic driver of some of the longer scale, um, periodic phenomena, uh, that ultimately if you have rever- you have a, a, a periodicity and then you have a periodicity within that and another one within that, you know, the, the wheels within wheels model of Ezekiel kind of thing. Um, you might have a, a situation where the ultimate cycle is galactic, you know, that maybe something that's happening galactically is what is modulating the influx of, of cosmic material to the inner solar system. And that is totally feasible. Mm-hmm. And there are guys working on that. Um, I don't know what the upshot of that will end up being, but, you know, I think it's very plausible. And that there may be subgalactic levels as well, you know, um, that we need to be looking at. And then the role of the great outer planets we've talked about, the, the way the outer planets marshal uh, the influx of comets to the inner solar system. Um, so, yeah, there's a whole architecture of the cosmos. And we're, our world, our planet is intrinsically a part of that, and we're not isolated from it. And the things that go on in that level – translate back to life down here on the surface, including what we're talking about when we look at some of these ice cores that show the climate doing this. You know, if the climate is doing this, if the climate's doing this now, and we build our civilization when the climate is doing this, what's life on earth like when the climate is doing this, right? So my point is, something is driving this. It's not just happening. 
you know, don't just come and say, well, it's just happening. Um, we don't need to look for an explanation. I think something is driving that. But what is it? Is it something intrinsic to the earth that is endogenic from within? Or is it exogenic? And I'm definitely leaning towards the exogenic uh, source for that. And that possibly the endogenic may actually be a response. And in fact, I think there is evidence, Mm -hmm. which is all of the material we're going to be exploring throughout this series of podcasts. What happens to the geomagnetic field during an impact or an encounter? You know, what are the atmospheric consequences? What are the climatic consequences? In addition to what are the, the biotic consequences? What happens to life? when you have a major catastrophe and that major catastrophe also may be uh, supercharging the biosphere with catalytic materials from outer space. Does that have a a biological function? Well, I think there's enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that yes, it does. So, you know, from whatever perspective we come to this at, I think it comes to the same thing that we're in a position now where we as a functioning society can really begin to, to understand the larger cosmic environment that we're a part of. Right. And I think, it's going to be absolutely essential for our long-term survival that we do that. And the other thing is, is that, you know, as we begin to, to get this a much more clear uh, indication of what's going on in our cosmic neighborhood, once we get a better inventory of this, the other thing to me is that, look, what we're already learning about these objects is that these are just awesomely, unbelievably rich sources of, of valuable all kinds of stuff. They're they're like supercharged cosmic care packages of resources that an expanding civilization would need to survive. But interestingly, and here the thing is, is that those which are the most dangerous because they come to the closest to Earth itself are actually the most accessible. So rather than blowing stuff apart, I would rather go, let's go out there and harvest these things. Let's extract the resources, all of it, whatever it's made. If it's iron and silica and there's hydrocarbons in there, let's just use them up until they don't exist anymore and Mm. and, and access those resources uh, to create a higher level, a higher, a cosmic infrastructure, if you will, thereby maybe simultaneously releasing the, 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 the terrestrial biosphere from the effects of, you know, an industrial-based civilization. And I think that's all within our range. I mean, I made this point in, 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 my, in my first, in, um, recently in an article I wrote, and I may include this in my first blog post, that, you know, when my grandparents were born in the late 1800s, I mean, there were, there were trains, but most people got around on foot or by horseback. You know, cars were just a, a, a you know, sort of a wild idea. And, you know, maybe there were a few test vehicles, you know, uh, you know, fuel driven vehicles, but nobody was driving cars. All the roads were dirt roads, you know, there were no airplanes. I mean, that's my grandparents. Now, when I was born in 51, we had no space presence, right? We're sitting here right now having this zoom conference because of our space-based presence, you know, 2000 satellites, communication satellites, is enabling what we're doing right now. But the world that I came into and was born in in 1951, we wouldn't be doing this, right? We had no presence in space. So this has completely come about in my lifetime. And until when when my grandparents were born, we were strictly confined to the surface of the earth. The human species was strictly, yeah, hot air balloons was about the one exception, but human beings were strictly confined to the surface of the earth. I mean, think about that. I mean, you know, and just really a a turnover of a few generations. So my point here is this, where could we be in a half century now if we had the will to do it? But, you know, we're so wrapped up in in things that are just of no long-term consequence whatsoever. You know, I mean, I don't want to get political, but, you know, right now politics has got people so wrapped up in things that 10 years, 20 years from now are not going to matter at all. In the long-term survival of civilization, they are not going to matter at all. And so people are just consumed. Our educational system has is basically completely dropped the ball. It is no longer teaching critical thinking skills at all. It's just teaching conformity. 
And this is dangerous because we need rebels. We need people who will think outside the box. We need people who will say, yeah, we can do that. People who can walk into, just like in Chicago, people walked into the burning ashes, this the still smoldering ashes of, of the city that had just burned to the ground. And within days, they were rebuilding the city. And a year and a half later, they built it back better than it was. And still in the smoldering units, you had people setting up makeshift restaurants to feed the workers that were coming back in who are not going to sit at home and wait for government handouts. No, they got their asses back out and they rebuilt the city. And they did the same damn thing in 1906 with San Francisco. Where is that mindset? That's the mindset we need right now. And you know what it's going to probably take? It's probably going to take another Tunguska to knock out a million people before we get shocked out of this, this trance that everybody is walking around in. Because that's what it is. It's like people are walking around. When I, when I see people with these hoods on, particularly in addition to the masks, I'm thinking, what? what? You know, just let's go up there and paint it black so then you don't have to see anything out there in this big dangerous world of, you know, of invisible threats that are going to leap off the bushes at you when you walk by. That's my take on it anyway. So well, to bring it back to the fireballs, just in case there's anything else to cover with that procession of 1913, because we are running short of time. Um, there, there have been several prominent sightings uh, recently. I know one of them was uh, across Australia was this big green glowing thing that uh, was a, was a meteoroid. Um, mm -hmm. uh, they say though, and obviously they're not in 1913 having things in orbit, right? Space program. You said 1951. So Sputnik was 53 or 56, somewhere in there. You know, now there's all kinds of space trash. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of people, pieces of garbage in space that we put up there and, uh, you know, it's been decommissioned or broken up, whatever. And that stuff re-enters the atmosphere. So I have read multiple times that when you have these long, slow, nearly parallel fireballs that do break up, that it's trash. Which is actually human, human yeah. garbage that we've left in space. Now, this procession of 1913 was, you know, was similar. Similar. Was that a skipping event or just barely grazed the atmosphere and got pulled in? Um, but as you said, it's just going to be a different angle of entry. And all of a sudden, instead of burning up, those are going to explode. And, and like you just said, that's what it's going to take for people to really uh, have their sh consciousness shaken awake. Sadly. sadly, 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 yes. Yeah, and hopefully it'll be something more like a, like a Chelyabinsk, where it blows out a bunch of windows and but doesn't kill anyone. But I think if something like that happened over a major, you know, like in a in a huge metropolitan area, that would right. probably right, exactly right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's anything say between a Chelyabinsk and a and a Tunguska is going to be a major event. Well, you know, you said that it took 20 years for people to get to the epicenter. Mm -hmm. If something like Tunguska happened today, out in the middle of nowhere, we'd be there the next day. Yes. With with drones and all kinds of stuff. So yeah. that could be, you know, that's that, that would be a major thing, even if nobody was, you know, in right. the immediate zone. However... You know, even as, as you know, we pointed out that um, what, what uh, Isaac Asimov was pointing out is that even back in 1908, there weren't that many areas on the globe where you could have that much devastation without killing a bunch of people. And, and that would be even rarer today. Right. I mean, where could you have an event like that that decimates 800 square miles completely yeah, and not, not kill people? The land. Yeah. It'd have to be you, over water. You may have yeah, all those have secondary effects also, though, that people yeah. are going to witness globally mm -hmm. and uh, trace it back to an event. Right, right. So There's some pretty big yeah. places out here in Texas where ain't nobody. <laughs> well, there's a, okay. There's a reason for that. Mike, maybe it's you Texas. could... Maybe you could, uh, Mike, you could work on uh, setting up and arranging a demonstration over rural Texas. Because since we've decided now that's what's going to take, I mean, you pulled some strings with your higher ups that. Um, yeah, if, we, if if a Tunguska happens over 
parts of West Texas, it'll bl- explode and you won't be able to tell the difference. It'll <laughs> still be on fire and it'll only be rock. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I, I really agree with everything you said, Randall, but but I vote we blow at least one of them up. I know. Let's blow some up. Come on. Oh, I mean, mining is fine. Okay. But it's not as cool as blowing them up. And okay. Brad's got his hat on. So. Yeah. Ah, uh oh. <laughs> that was great. Well, we've got more juicy stuff to dive into. And, you know, we're going to be making that segue from macro, yeah. from micro to macro. And that will lead in. Hopefully, hopefully, we're still on the go for September. When we're going to spend a week traversing some of the greatest catastrophic floodlands on Earth. Yep. And we will try to decipher that story. And, uh, yeah, we've got, what, eight weeks, eight and a half? What do we got here, nine weeks till that? Yeah, it's under nine weeks now. Oh, man. Yeah, Yeah, but uh, as it it stands... The, se- the Segway is not a zero-radius mower. The Segway is a (laughs) tanker... You know, so it's going to be several, several episodes before we actually make right, this that is not a zero, turn. This is not a zero point turn. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to no, get it's, there. We're not going to do a hairpin turn, but we're going to do a nice, it's, you know, over an episode or two. Cause I want to, I want to talk sure. a little bit more about nano diamonds and, and, and make, if nothing, briefly look at some of the studies from South America that have come out, Antarctica and Europe and maybe even Syria, just, and not get into them super deep, just, you know, a few minutes on each one. So people are aware of how the, the map of the, of the evidence keeps expanding. Um, and at what point do we say, yeah, I mean, I don't know, is it going to turn out to be found over the whole globe? I was pretty surprised when this study showed up uh, impact proxies in Antarctica dating from the YDB. So I want to look at that a little bit and see what what exactly did they find there, um, and yeah, the nano diamonds and that that'll pretty much, I think, cover the the but most. You know, obviously we could get into it way more, but give people a good handle on this is the kind of proxy evidence we're talking about here. You know, we're talking about nano diamonds, magnetic grains, microspherals, carbon spherals, melt glass, iridium, platinum, possibly some osmium. Um, what else? Some other things. Um, but it's the collection of these things. It's these things taken together that pretty much exclude any other possible explanation. You know, it's been argued, well, the microspheres you're looking at, they're naturally occurring framboids. Well, when you look at them under energy dispersive spectroscopy, it shows up that it's a very different animal than some organically created terrestrial phenomena. But superficially you could see how yeah you could mistake one for the other because they look very similar but you know it's important to understand how you get a rain of of vapor condensing out of the atmosphere that requires heat of 10,000 degrees centigrade to produce and we're finding those you know over europe we're finding them over south america we're finding them all over unglaciated north america and our uh, investigation of Lake Hind is going to now show the correlation between those two, the micro and the macro, because we're going to see that younger driest boundary layer has the imprint, has the fingerprints. And right there juxtaposed on the fingerprints are the footprints. So if you want to get out and see the footprints out in the Scablands of Washington, go to contact at the cabin. Yeah com slash Carlson. And uh, there's a few spaces left and uh, we'd love to have you with us out there. And uh, we will be, as you said, getting to several episodes uh, to discuss that before the trip actually occurs in uh, mm-hmm. mid-September. Late well, I think September. We'll, we'll be able to get in at least three or four episodes. At least. Excellent. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And for anybody who does sign up and gets a spot, we will be doing some some Zoom conferences for the attendees too. Yes, That'll, and you guys can all everybody who's signed up and has paid for a spot will be able to join in and pester Randall with questions. It's great. That's right. Well, and you I would like to people. emphasize that it was that's important that they do so. That's right, it's because for. It, it's part of like, look, it's just like you're going to a foreign country. Before you go, you want to study up on the language. On the language. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna we're gonna that's begin right. to learn some of the language so that when we're out there, I don't have to constantly translate everything. 
you know, if I'm right. talking about a rhythmite as compared to a var, if you're going to know the difference. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So we're still planning to go. No, no change there. So definitely go to contact the cabin.com forward slash, uh, Carlson and look for the, look for that and get a hold of Darren if you want to sign up. And uh, you guys can get a hold of us, Cosmographia1618 at gmail.com. Everything else is in the show notes, all the email addresses, all the links, uh, and other things that Brad puts in there. So, right, right, Brad? Stuff. What else? Good stuff. Yeah. Yep. I uh, look forward to this day podcast. every week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we go, I want to give a shout out to Brad and all of the hard work that he puts in. Brad does a lot of work. He does a lot of work. Yep. Let us not downplay the role of Brad. That's right. And Kyle does all the audio editing. I just, I just sit down and I, all I have to do is show up. Well, yeah, we, I mean, the re- only reason you're here is for, for sex appeal. That's, <laughs> I mean, hey. one for that, you know, <laughs> I got that covered. <laughs> all right, guys. Good night. Great good, show. Enjoy good, night. good night. Good night. Well done. Good night. Good night.